ओके सर गो अहेड मेरे भाई ओके एम आई ऑडिबल यस यू आर on behalf of the indian law institute kerala state unit i'd like to wish everyone who has joined us today a very good evening my name is mitha and i will be hosting this session in the series of online lectures organized by the indian law institute kerala state unit today's lecture is by advocate shreya rastogi on the role of legal professionals in understanding forensic evidence without further ado i request advocate sham kumar vm to welcome the gathering thank you mitha Good evening to you all. On behalf of the Indian Law Institute, Kerala State Unit, I welcome you to this online event. One of the interesting cases involving the use of forensic techniques in the state of Kerala was the early decision of the Justice T. Chandrasekhar in a case involving the murder of Chandran Nair. interestingly in that case superimposition as a technique was used for the first time in the state and the prosecution had examined professor uma datter who is a expert in forensic medicine i remember that was the case in which forensic evidence and forensic techniques was very effectively challenged their legal validity was exhaustively put to trial by the eminent lawyer advocate k v veerachandra menon who was appearing for the accused in that case ultimately uh, in the judgment that was rendered which i would term as a classic decision on forensic medicine its evidentiary value the honorable judge he held that the deposition by professor kumar datter is valid and sustainable and as far as the identity of the victim from his skull that was that all that was remaining out of his the body was valid and the superimposition technique is something that can be used to convict the accused recently the same superimposition technique i understand was used in the sheila bora case forensic technique has come a long way and we have with us today shreya rastogi who is an expert on the subject i welcome her to this online event on behalf of the indian law institute kerala state unit i welcome the honorable judges presiding officers the advocates the law students members of the legal faculty and all those research scholars from the various departments across the state of kerala i welcome you all Mida, back to you. Thank you, sir. Today's session is being live streamed on the YouTube channel of the Indian Law Institute, Kerala State Unit, and will also be available for subsequent viewing. I'd like to mention that there will be a short question and answer session at the end of the lecture. The audience may send in their questions using the comment section on the YouTube channel. Moving on. Advocate Shreya Rastogi is a founding member of Project Thirty Nine A, a criminal justice initiative at national law university delhi and heads their work on forensic and death penalty litigation as part of project 39a's work on forensics advocate shreya led a survey of forensic science laboratories in india conducted in collaboration with the ministry of home affairs this survey aimed to understand the challenges facing the administration and functioning of forensic laboratories and provide recommendations to strengthen the forensic science system Advocate Shreya was also invited as an expert to depose before the Rajya Sabha Parliamentary Standing Committee on the DNA Technology Bill 2019. She has also conducted several training programs on legal and scientific aspects of different types of forensic disciplines with district judges, prosecutors, police officers and lawyers. Advocate Shreya appears regularly before the Honorable Supreme Court and various high courts in death penalty matters handled by Project 39A. There is no one better to handle today's lecture that focuses on the importance of forensic evidence amongst the legal fraternity. Though the science of forensics is rapidly developing and growing, the legal system and its guardians, as lawyers, are still left baffled by the intricacies of forensic evidence. We hope that today's lecture will shed some light on this often overlooked area of law. 
Without further ado, I pass the screen to our esteemed speaker. Thank you so much, Mita, uh, for that wonderful introduction and, and to Sham sir as well um, uh, for such an inter interesting uh, uh, case history to be provided at the beginning of this lecture. So um, I'd, uh, I mean, to all my audience members here, uh, you may be legal professionals who are either um, uh, finding this uh, evidence, forensic evidence in your cases as you defend your clients or you may be um, uh, professionals who um, are representing victims and often um, want to avail uh, forensic evidence uh, towards uh, the aims of uh, conviction. Um, you may be prosecutors who are dealing with uh, uh, this kind of evidence or as uh, judges or judicial officers who have to adjudicate upon um, uh, such forensic evidence. So uh, I believe that uh, today's uh, discussion may help all of us. Um, and um, I'd like to begin by providing a slight, um, a brief uh, introduction to Project 39A's uh, work on forensics. Uh, so our aim is towards ensuring that, the, that there is use of scientifically valid and reliable forensic evidence uh, within the criminal justice system. And we do this by, through our research, uh, some, some of that uh, Mita spoke about in the introduction, uh, where we've conducted a comprehensive survey of forensic science laboratories in India. Uh, through our litigation, uh, where we find forensic evidence being used in cases. Now, this may be evidence which is either um, a pointing towards uh, guilt or also evidence that may point towards exoneration. Um, and, and, and that is the evidence that we look to uh, examine and, uh, uh, and also in many ways challenge that evidence before the court. Uh, through our advocacy, and some of that, again, uh, was said about in the introduction with our work um, on the DNA profiling bill and capacity building, uh, like the session here today. So um, while I'll be restricting most of my uh, session and focusing on the use of forensics uh, within the criminal justice system, I believe that it would be helpful also for those of us uh, who are involved in civil practice. And I'd like to begin by um, uh, looking at what are the crucial uh, questions that are involved in any criminal trial? Now, of course, uh, the main question that is there before the court is um, whether the accused who is on trial has committed the offense. And also in that sense, the truth seeking element of who in fact has actually committed the offense. Uh, but to arrive at this ultimate question, some of the other questions that the court looks at are where is this offense been committed? When was it committed and how was it committed? And uh, forensics is something that can help in answering all of these questions. So the different types of forensic disciplines that we may see in, in, in uh, being used within the criminal justice process, uh, they uh, can, they are, um, uh, they emanate from uh, either laboratory-based scientific methods, uh, which have been, um, uh, and the applications of these methods towards uh, uh, criminal investigation, or these may also be methods which are actually based on observation and skill. Um, and uh, they've natively been developed as part of police investigations by police officers. So if I was to provide examples of these, uh, as you'd see here on the screen, um, there are methods which are developed uh, from application of uh, biological uh, techniques or uh, chemical analysis, like uh, uh, drugs and toxicology. So these are what we would normally refer to as laboratory-based methods. The other type of methods, such as uh, pattern matching uh, analysis um, or fingerprint analysis, in, in which you will have fingerprint analysis, footwear, uh, firearms and tool marks, these are what are based on observation and skill, right? Um, and um, normally when we talk about uh, um, a forensic science laboratory, you'll find that um, uh, typically these different disciplines would form different divisions of an FSL, right? Uh, but it is also possible that uh, not all of these uh, disciplines will be available uh, for practice within an FSL. Um, it's also important to understand here that while some of these disciplines can help us in identifying or individualizing 
uh, the um, uh, the true perpetrator of the crime. Some of these uh, disciplines may actually uh, lend us in providing answers to questions about the different circumstances of the offense. For instance, where the offense may have been committed. So in providing that crucial link or in providing link towards the modus operandi or how the offense was in fact committed. Now, if you think about the, uh, the structure of forensic science in India, we have to think of uh, uh, these two different uh, systems which are present. One is the forensic science system where you have a, 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 um, a hierarchy of laboratories starting with the central forensic science laboratories, uh, which are directly under the central government. And then the bulk of the labs, which are actually under uh, various state governments and union territories. Now, within a uh, state structure, uh, there are, of course, uh, the um, state forensic science laboratories, and under them uh, lie the regional forensic science labs. So what we know currently is that there are 117 um, labs, uh, forensic science laboratories in the country. Um, uh, and within them, there are eight uh, central labs, uh, 31 uh, SFSLs, and 78 RFSLs. In Kerala itself, there is one SFSL, and uh, uh, which is uh, at Trivandrum, of course, uh, as many of you would know, and three uh, RFSLs in Thrissur, uh, Kannur, and Kochi. The other system, the other parallel system, is often referred to as the forensic medicine system. Now, this is the system where uh, medical examination of um, uh, victims and accused uh, is conducted. And this is conducted, uh, as many of you would again know, it's conducted in government uh, hospitals. Uh, so these may either be hospitals which are autonomous institutions um, or central government hospitals, state government hospitals, and often even municipal hospitals. Uh, why it's important to understand this link between these two systems is, of course, uh, in the context of biological evidence uh, or uh, uh, many kinds of physical evidence, which may be collected as part of medical examinations, uh, as part of the forensic medicine system, therefore, and then is sent to uh, the forensic science laboratories for further analysis. Now, uh, before I get into uh, uh, some of the discussions and debates around different types of forensic disciplines, I want to broadly cover um, the legal framework for examination of uh, uh, forensic um, evidence in our uh, jurisdiction. So we, we have section 45, which covers um, the law on expert evidence. And I'll also briefly be talking about uh, section 293 of CRPC, which provides an exemption uh, for specific government ex experts uh, from uh, deposing before the court and allowing their uh, reports to be proved uh, uh, without uh, requiring their um, oral deposition. So section 45, uh, as uh, we would know, uh, is what um, allows the courts to rely upon the opinion of um, um, uh, experts, right? So this is a statutory provision uh, uh, which um, is an exception to the rule that we have in common law, which is against opinion evidence. Um, our Evidence Act doesn't normally allow for opinions to be relied upon, but expert evidence is a, a notable exception to that rule. Um, so this exception will only apply in those cases and, and 45, uh, section 45 provides five different areas, uh, including the area of science, uh, where expert evidence can be uh, brought in. And it will allow um, the evidence of those individuals who are specially skilled in these specific areas. Now, over the years, uh, courts have, of course, laid down different requirements that need to be fulfilled uh, before relying upon the opinion of um, any expert. And these are the two seminal cases uh, under Section 45. These requirements are, uh, firstly, it has to be an um, area which is a recognized field of expertise. Now, when we're talking about uh, uh, science, um, we will, in a moment, I will come to what it means for an area to be a recognized field. Uh, but that is uh, an important aspect that has to be considered by the courts. 
Secondly, uh, if the person is an expert in that specific area. Uh, the next uh, uh, um, few uh, requirements are uh, whether the evidence is based on reliable principles. So for the courts to examine um, how the expert has actually conducted the examination and whether uh, it shows that it has been conducted in a reliable manner. Next, that if the scientific uh, criteria for examining the accuracy uh, of the conclusions has been provided. So what is the basis on which uh, the expert has conducted this examination and whether that basis uh, which will enable the court to judge the accuracy and credibility of that expert opinion is provided along with that report. Um, courts have also held in certain uh, situations that um, expert evidence, while we know that uh, uh, it is only advisory in nature, and uh, usually the nature of this evidence is corroborative uh, and cannot be the sole basis of conviction, but in certain situations, courts have held that uh, adverse inference will be taken against the prosecution in the absence of this evidence. So uh, that's usually in DNA cases and as well as in NDPS cases that the courts have made this kind of observation. Now, how should this evidence be examined? So the first aspect that we look at is the admissibility of this evidence. And this is where we go back to the first two requirements that we were talking about um, that were laid down in Jailal and in Ramesh Chandra Agarwal. Basically, what we're looking at here um, as part of admissibility is to see whether the evidence, whether the uh, techniques and methods that have been relied upon by the expert, are they in fact scientifically valid? And Sham sir was also mentioning uh, about this uh, in his introduction uh, uh, while dealing with uh, the case on superimposition. So whether superimposition is in fact a scientifically valid technique. And how will we go to uh, go on to determine the scientific validity of any technique? There are three important questions that we have to look at. Firstly, whether that technique is accurate and is fit for purpose. This is to say whether the technique will in fact provide us the correct answer and the answer to the question that we are in fact looking for. Right? Next, is the technique repeatable? So this would include that if I was to, if I'm a forensic examiner and I'm doing um, this, uh, I'm employing this technique and I'm doing that examination again and again, am I getting the same result or am I getting different results? Because when we talk about science, one would assume that um, a scientific result should remain the same, irrespective of how many times I do that examination. The next, which is that, is the technique reproducible? Now, reproducibility refers to something that whether I do the examination or whether someone else was to do the examination, the same result uh, um, should be arrived upon. Now, when we look at um, these issues of accuracy, repeatability, and reprodu reproducibility, uh, we find that uh, different forensic disciplines actually uh, um, uh, um, uh, can be, I mean, the, the, the scientific uh, validity of different forensic disciplines can be judged differently, right? Uh, so one of the important reports that I would urge everyone to look at, uh, and much of this scientific data, unfortunately, is data which isn't available uh, and hasn't been, this, this research hasn't been done in India, but a lot of this research uh, comes from uh, the U.S., um, but I would say that considering the nature of science and considering the nature of natural sciences, these results can't be different uh, whether they're uh, conducted in the US or in India. And so therefore they find equal application for our system as well, right? So this report that I was mentioning is uh, um, the report of President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. It's a 2016 report, and this report was commissioned by the then uh, President uh, uh, Barack Obama, asking um, a high-level group of scientists in the US to look at the foundational validity of seven forensic techniques. And here, uh, the, the techniques that they were looking at was uh, DNA profiling, fingerprints, bite marks, hair analysis, ballistics. And, and the report found that all of these techniques, in fact, have subjective elements 
and that with the exception of um, uh, uh, single cells DNA profile, all techniques um, involves a certain level of subjectivity on part of the examiner. Right? Uh, this report also holds that uh, any results, any kind of forensic results stating uh, uniqueness uh, of matches or that 100% uh, accuracy are in fact incorrect. And the way in which uh, these uh, examiners arrived upon these conclusions is by looking at uh, a, a meta-analysis of all scientific research that has been done underlying all of these techniques. So I'd like to share some of this, uh, um, uh, uh, this research regarding a uh, few of these disciplines. So the first example I want to take is in fact of bite mark analysis. And bite mark analysis has in the last 10 years has actually been uh, looked at uh, um, in a lot of detail. And uh, in fact, last year, uh, uh, NIST, uh, uh, a prominent uh, um, a scientific organization in the US, has actually come out with a report uh, holding that um, bite mark analysis lacks foundational validity. Uh, and on three counts, right? Firstly, that there is no basis to say that, in fact, the um, dental patterns that uh, humans have, and especially the anterior patterns, which is the front teeth that are involved in any kind of um, a biting incident, there is nothing to suggest that our patterns, our dental patterns are in fact unique, right? Secondly, that uh, there is nothing to suggest that these patterns would be accurately and consistently transferred onto the human skin. Now, the reason why they say this is because human skin, the nature of human skin is such that it is highly elastic. And so therefore, um, during a, a biting incident, uh, the way in which your uh, teeth may and, and the, the structure uh, of the teeth, uh, how that may be transferred onto the skin, actually, um, there may be a lot of struggle because the, the skin is of such an elastic nature that the pattern may not actually the, the unique features or the features, the characteristics of the pattern may not actually be transferred onto the skin accurately and also consistently. So that's to say that if I was to make three different uh, bite marks on my skin right now, one might bite mark may actually differ from the other, right? And third, that, um, uh, that there is no technique for us to accurately and consistently analyze these patterns which are rendered on the skin so as to be able to uniquely identify one individual and exclude all others as the source of that bite mark. So these three assumptions, which are the crucial assumptions underlying any kind of bite mark te technique, have been falsified as part of uh, this report. Um, reports have also found, and, and, uh, and this is all uh, mentioned in the PCAST report that I mentioned earlier, that the false positive rate, uh, uh, and so false positive uh, refers to error rates where um, I have positively identified two things to have the same source, although that is an incorrect identification, right? So a false positive rate uh, with bite mark analysis can be as high as one in six. That's 17%, right? Um, and uh, also when we go uh, to look at the uh, repeatability and reproducibility of bite marks, uh, where we are examining whether two different bite mark experts will actually come to the same results, studies have found that in only four out of 100 cases, can experts in fact consistently agree that an injury was in fact a human bite mark, right? let alone whether it came from the same individual. Even the consistency in this determination of an injury being a human bite mark, there is this little uh, consistency in, uh, in what uh, experts believe. And, and here on the screen, I provide an example of uh, Stephen Cheney's case. It's a very famous case uh, from Texas uh, where Cheney was uh, convicted for a uh, uh, murder of a couple, um, uh, robbery and murder. And uh, uh, one of the pieces of evidence that was used to convict him was actually bite marks that were found on the victim's uh, forearm. 
uh, and uh, those bite marks which were on the victim's forearm were then compared to the dental molds of, uh, uh, of Cheney. Uh, so at the time of the original trial, the odontologists had said that there is a one in a million possibility that any other person could have made the same bite marks. Um, now, of course, uh, the jury went on to rely upon this evidence and then convicted Cheney. But uh, over the years, as we learned more about bite mark uh, analysis and the fact that it has no foundational validity uh, due to a new law that was introduced in Texas, where uh, new scientific evidence uh, in cases where new scientific evidence has come in uh, uh, to um, um, uh, cast doubt on uh, the previous um, uh, forensic evidence that have been used in cases, which this has often been referred to as junk science law, um, the conviction in older cases could have been reopened. And so uh, Cheney got the benefit of that uh, reopening of his conviction. And as part of his new trial, in fact, the older odontologist, um, one of them uh, came forward and submitted an affidavit that considering the new evidence uh, that is there before uh, as part of the uh, scientific analysis of, uh, of bite mark comparisons, he can no longer uh, um, support the older testimony of one in a million um, probability, right? Uh, so that is how uh, um, uh, uh, this kind of evidence has been relied upon in other jurisdictions and the powerful nature of this foundational evidence. Um, uh, again, I want to quickly just use the example of uh, uh, fingerprint analysis. And here, uh, um, one of the main things that we know about fingerprints is that uh, unlike the, the myth that many of us hold that uh, fingerprints are known to be unique, a AAAS report in 2017 has found that there is no scientific basis. Currently, there is no scientific evidence to say that um, each of our fingerprints are in fact unique. Yes, there may be a lot of uh, uh, features which may differ from one individual to the other, but there is no basis that we can say in terms of how many other individuals in the world may not have the same features, right? Uh, so that uh, this this idea that we've had that fingerprints are in fact unique, uh, there is no scientific basis currently to support that. Uh, one of the main uh, cases, uh, um, uh, which was again uh, heavily discussed, was Brandon Mayfield's case uh, uh, from 2004, where he was involved in um, and arrested in connection with the Madrid train bombings uh, in Spain. Um, now, one of uh, the pieces of evidence uh, uh, that actually uh, got the investigators to look into him was a plastic bag which was found where there was a latent print, and you'll be able to see that the quality of that print on the uh, uh, bottom left corner. So that was the print that they found on the plastic bag uh, where uh, uh, detonating devices uh, were uh, 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 were kept in. And um, multiple uh, FBI examiners actually claimed that this uh, print uh, was matched with, uh, with Mayfield. Now, Mayfield was someone who had previously served uh, in the U.S. Army and thereafter had retired. And that's why his prints were on the FBI uh, database that the Interpol used. Um, and uh, um, as the uh, investigators started looking into Mayfield, uh, they also actually looked at other aspects of his life. So uh, after retiring from uh, the U.S. Um, Army, he had... Um, Actually, uh, uh, um, um, I mean, he had converted to Islam and that got uh, the investigators even more uh, interested in his uh, in his case. Right. Um, however, later on, uh, uh, the Spanish authorities found that this fingerprint was linked to an Algerian national and all other pieces of evidence was actually pointing towards um, Brandon Mayfield not being involved. Uh, it was only this fingerprint, this uh, partial match, which was being found with this extremely low quality print, um, uh, which led to his arrest. Next, with ballistics as well, uh, we know that there is no scientific basis to actually prove the uniqueness of uh, fire uh, firearms or tool mark uh, analysis. Um, and in fact, a very recent 2020 study showed um, that in a third of the cases, examiners will differ from their own opinion that they have previously 
uh, arrived at in saying that two bullets have been actually uh, uh, fired from the same gun, right? Uh, uh, which goes towards uh, showing the very low repeatability uh, of uh, firearm uh, analysis uh, or what's also known as ballistics analysis. Again, uh, we know that uh, examiners also, this, uh, um, so in, in this study, which was conducted by uh, Ames, uh, which is a US national laboratory and FBI, uh, they also found that uh, the second examiner would often disagree from the first examiner and the rate of disagreement can be as high as 69% uh, in cases where the bullets are actually uh, known to be from two different sources. Right. Uh, so all of this should actually give us reason to pause and think about um, are we considering these foundational questions of how valid these different disciplines are? And uh, are we weighing this uh, when we are considering this evidence in our individual cases? Right. The next part of uh, um, 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 examination uh, when we are looking at uh, um, examining any kind of forensic evidence is actually the weight of the evidence. And while looking at the weight of the evidence, some of the questions that we often look at are whether this expert who has conducted the examination in my case, is that expert actually qualified in that area? And uh, have they accurately and reliably applied the technique in that case? And have they provided me enough data and materials and reasons to show that they have uh, accurately arrived upon their opinion, right? So uh, the things that we would look at uh, when we are uh, uh, looking at this application is obviously the qualifications like I've talked about and the reliable ac application and also the, um, the, the way in which the expert has then reported the results. So the expert may have reliably uh, applied the technique but the opinion that they have finally arrived at, is that also correctly uh, stated in their report? Right? Now, towards looking at uh, this, uh, uh, the, the reliable application, some of the things that we should ensure that we have access to are, of course, the documentation. Uh, now, this documentation, like many of us would know, uh, should include the entire chain of custody documentation. So, um, 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 for instance, in case of biological evidence that I was uh, previously referring to, this should include uh, the way in which that evidence has traveled from the crime scene or from uh, um, the government hospital where it may have been collected as part of either medical examination or as part of post-mortem examination. How has that evidence traveled from there um, till the forensic laboratory? Also, even when this um, evidence reaches the forensic lab, it's not as if it will be examined on the same day. So where was this evidence kept within the laboratory? Who all have access to this evidence? Uh, so this will require documentation right from the crime scene uh, in terms of uh, seizure memos, in terms of looking at the police evidence rules or uh, which, are, which are also called as malkhanas, the police malkhanas, uh, where the evidence is often stored. Uh, who all had uh, access to entering into this, uh, who all have actually uh, touched this evidence um, and how this evidence was then forwarded, um, whether there were receipts which were issued, um, uh, do we know the conditions of the seals uh, and the packaging of this, ex uh, of this evidence, all of that uh, needs to be looked at as part of documentation. Other than this, the other documentation that often uh, many of us may not actually ask for, but we should, is the laboratory documentation. And in a moment, I will, uh, through a case study, I'd like to uh, showcase why looking at laboratory documentation is so important. Um, and I'll use, use an example of a DNA case uh, uh, that we uh, uh, recently did. The next things that we should look at are, in fact, uh, the standards that have been followed by the expert, right? Uh, so what are the protocols that they actually follow? Do you have access to those working procedure manuals? Um, uh, have you looked at if the scientist has referred to certain studies um, in, in their report or, or uh, the opinion that they have based uh, um, is uh, that... Um, this person's, uh, uh, like for instance, that the bite marks which have been found uh, uh, 
uh, on the victim are uniquely identified to this uh, um, um, uh, accused, then do you know what is the scientific basis on which the expert has said this? Are there any studies that they can rely upon to uh, back their claim of uniqueness, right? So you should look to ask for all of that. Um, Right. So this is something that I've already covered um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the first point. In terms of uh, DNA evidence, uh, some of the other things that the courts often look at are uh, uh, whether the uh, quality control and quality assurance procedures have been followed uh, by the examiner, if the possibility of contamination has been eliminated and whether it seems as if the way in which the evidence was handled either before it reached the lab or while it was within the laboratory itself because contamination is something that can occur at any stage. And again, I want to just take a moment to explain that contamination in the context of DNA does not mean necessarily tampering. Tampering is something that when we think of is where someone is actually uh, uh, with an intent is um, um, uh, um, uh, kind of destroying the integrity of the sample. But contamination is something which can be both advertent and inadvertent. And contamination can happen given the sensitive nature of DNA. It can happen um, through various methods. So if I'm not wearing proper gloves as I'm handling evidence, then my DNA from my skin cells may get deposited and that may contaminate the evidence. Um, so that's why when we're dealing with biological evidence uh, and when we're talking about contamination in the context of biological evidence, we're not really looking for intent, right? And that's why the highest um, uh, standards have to be applied to ensure that no contamination has occurred, right? Courts have also said that uh, the uh, 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 that DNA results should be supported with statistical analysis. Now, this is because forensic DNA profiling is something which is inherently probabilistic in nature. It is not something which is allowing us to uniquely identify an individual. Um, and again, here, uh, I'll just quickly explain uh, what I mean by this. Uh, so while every person's DNA is known to be unique, Yes, that is a scientific fact. But a forensic DNA profile, which is only examining a few locations in a person's DNA and not their entire DNA profile, uh, that therefore is probabilistic in nature. So therefore, two individuals who are unrelated may still have the same forensic DNA profile. And that's why such results must be supported uh, with statistical analysis. This is something that we often don't find in our reports, but the law now requires for that to be done. Now, these are some of the things that should be there that you should ensure that you have as part of your DNA case uh, 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 as, as legal professionals. So that is um, electronic raw data uh, that is generated um, after DNA profiling has been done. The electrophorograms, the charts, uh, uh, that they're also called as sequencer charts or often graphs. On, uh, and why these are important is because the DNA results that are reported um, in any um, exhibited DNA report are actually on the basis of these graphs. These are the graphs that the examiner looks at, interprets, and then prepares their report. So therefore, it's critical that you have access to these uh, electrophorograms. Uh, you should also ask for bench notes and worksheets for every single process of DNA profiling to ensure that uh, those processes have been done properly and obviously the working procedure manual, right? Uh, now, I want to just take the remaining few minutes to uh, discuss very quickly a, uh, uh, a case study. Uh, so this was a case where um, uh, which involved uh, uh, rape and murder. And uh, um, uh, one of the main pieces of evidence was actually uh, the uh, DNA evidence. So the DNA evidence was uh, um, obtained from uh, the samples that were sent for DNA analysis were actually um, the uh, vaginal um, and genital samples of the deceased. And those were then uh, compared with the uh, reference blood profile uh, of the accused, right? Um, and uh, we got involved in this case uh, at the high court stage. Uh, and uh, often as uh, in trials, um, because uh, the DNA report was prepared 
uh, uh, by a government uh, forensic expert uh, who were covered under Section 293, uh, they were not present uh, before the court to, um, at, at the time of trial. So only their report was presented. Uh, and their report was presented without any of the underlying documents that I've just referred to. For instance, the electrophorograms or the worksheets or the equipment logs or uh, the controls that they've used uh, and the standards that they followed. None of that was provided um, uh, at the time of trial. And so none of that was present um, uh, either uh, was that uh, um, was present uh, before the trial court or was provided uh, to the accused, right? So we made an application um, under section 367 and 391 of CRPC, and we were able to access these uh, documents. And we also uh, requested the court to remand the case uh, back to trial for the examination of the expert. So what I want to show here are some of the snippets from the cross-examination, and maybe they may give you ideas for the kind of questions that you may ask an expert um in such cross examinations so uh, firstly um uh, because we only had the report uh, that was present before the um, uh, that was presented during trial we did not as part of that report the qualifications of the experts were never written right um, and so as part of our cross we we asked them their qualifications and this is what we found that they were actually uh, their degrees were in um, chemistry and not in uh, either in uh, uh, forensic biology or in specifically in DNA profiling, right? Uh, they also had not done any kind of uh, research uh, or training in DNA. And this of course uh, will be very crucial as we are thinking of, as you look at these uh, questions on cross, think back to how they relate to the requirements under section 45, right? The next, um, uh, um, uh, we looked at uh, uh, whether the uh, controls that have to be used, uh, which are positive and negative controls as part of DNA profiling process. Um, now, these are controls uh, which help you ensure that, um, uh, that the process has run correctly, one, and that also that there has been no cross-contamination between samples. Um, so uh, that is what uh, uh, these controls are used for. So we, and this is something that has to be a part of every DNA profiling process. That's something that is recorded in working procedure manuals. That's something that is recorded in the DNA profiling kits and the manufacturer guidelines uh, for these kits. Uh, so uh, because we did not find the use of controls in the worksheets, um, uh, we asked that of the expert. And as you can see, uh, they admitted that uh, positive and negative controls uh, uh, need to be used to ensure that uh, the process has the electrophoresis process, which is one of the stages of uh, the last, uh, one of the penultimate stages of DNA profiling, um, that that has, that during that process, these controls weren't uh, run. And uh, uh, without that, um, it cannot be uh, said uh, uh, that the process has uh, run correctly. Right. Uh, next, that uh, evidence and reference samples. Uh, this is something that protocols require in DNA profiling that evidence and reference samples should be run separately so that there is no cross contamination. But again, the expert here, because we were able to look at their equipment logs, we saw that the evidence samples, uh, that is the vaginal samples of the disease and the reference samples of the accused, they were actually run together. And this is again something that the expert admitted was incorrect, right? Um, next, um, the expert also admitted that uh, the electronic raw data and uh, the electrophorograms have not been provided along with their exhibited report. And that without looking at those uh, documents uh, and those materials, uh, the accuracy of the report cannot be reviewed. And so therefore this shows to us that the uh, that back to Jailal, uh, uh, where the Supreme Court said that the data and materials underlying every expert report have to be provided, those have uh, not formed a part of uh, this DNA report, right? Now, uh, before I go into the next two uh, issues of cross, I, I will need to quickly cover um, uh, some uh, basics of what's happening in DNA profiling so that uh, uh, everyone's able to follow those issues. So what you see here 
on um, uh, the left hand side is usually is a sample allelic table that you may often find in your cases. Now, uh, what this um, um, is, is in fact, uh, on the uh, left hand side, the column which is uh, mentioned as genetic markers, those are actually the locations on the DNA where the profile is being generated. And uh, the remaining columns are actually the columns uh, where the DNA profile is written. So these numbers that we find are actually what are known as alleles, right? Uh, alleles are basically um, uh, the number of repetitions of specific sequences that we are uh, uh, testing in DNA profiling. Now, uh, 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 the overall concept of forensic DNA profiling is that we know that these specific sequences or STRs are actually present in all individuals. But, um, and it's the same sequence that is present in all of the individuals at each of the locations, right? Um, so while the sequence that will be there in the D8 location may differ from the sequence that is there in FGA location, but each individual uh, in the world will have the same sequence. What will differ in the individuals will be the number of times that the sequence is repeating itself. So this repetition, this, these repeats are what are known as alleles, right? So that's why on each location, you will um, actually inherit um, uh, two repetitions. Uh, and the reason for that is that half of your DNA, as, you, uh, as many of you would know, half of your DNA we inherit from our biological uh, fathers and half from our biological mothers, right? So that's why on each location, an individual may have a maximum of two alleles. Now, the uh, what we are looking to do in DNA profiling is, is that we will first generate the forensic uh, profile for the evidence samples, then we will generate the forensic profile for the reference samples, and then we will compare whether I'm finding um, the um, genotypes, that is the allele pairs in the reference samples, am I finding those specific pairs in the uh, evidence samples? So that's how DNA profiling is done. And the way in which this table is generated is that um, uh, on the right hand side, what you see is a representation of an electrophorogram. So in the electrophorogram, the alleles actually appear as peaks and on each of the locus. So for instance, if I look at the D3 locus here, the alleles that are mentioned here are 17 and 18 and they will appear as uh, peaks. So what the expert does is then they look at the graphs, they look at what are the alleles that have been identified by the software uh, that is used in DNA profiling and whether they, uh, the expert then has the, um, uh, they have the discretion of checking whether the software has actually correctly identified the alleles or not. And after looking at these graphs and after doing that interpretation, they will then create this table, which you see on the left, uh, which you will often find as part of your exhibited reports. Right. Now, the two things, uh, the two issues that we found when we did the analysis with the EPGs in our case um, was that, one, there were many portions where there were peaks which were found in the EPGs, but they had not been marked. Right, And this is something that we actually put to the expert, because if these peaks are in fact alleles, then these may be alleles that the expert has ignored for some reason, but those reasons have not been provided. And if those uh, uh, peaks are in fact alleles, then that changes the DNA profile that has been found in those electrophorograms. So um, uh, when we put this to them, uh, uh, in the cross, uh, the explanation that came forward was that yes, uh, there are in fact peaks which are found in all of the EPGs uh, where uh, uh, while these peaks are there, uh, they have not been marked. And also, uh, the in fact, the expert gone, went on to say, in as you'll see in paragraph 52, that while the software may have marked these uh, peaks as alleles, but they may have been deleted by me, right? So the expert is in fact uh, accepting that kind of error. And that becomes extremely important because if we hadn't seen the electrophorograms, we wouldn't be able to check just by a report, uh, just by looking at uh, the exhibited report where you will have this kind of um, uh, uh, table which will be generated. Just by looking at that, you would not have figured out 
this issue, right? Okay. Um, the next issue that we found in this case was that there were locations where, in fact, um, there were alleles which had been marked and they were reported uh, in the exhibited uh, DNA report, but there is no peak, there is no allelic peak which is visible on them. And also, there is no height for the peak which were, uh, the expert mentioned uh, that uh, yes, uh, there are uh, uh, um, alleles which have been marked over here, as you will see uh, on this location, and number 18 has been marked, but there is no corresponding uh, peak or number 13 has been marked, but there is no corresponding peak uh, to that, right? So on what basis has this, have these alleles been marked and on what basis have they been reported? So there was no explanation for that. Right. And lastly, um, uh, the expert also, uh, after we looked at the electropherogram and uh, crossed them on the basis of the electropherogram, they admitted that on 13 out of the 24 loci that had been tested, uh, the cues was actually not found. Their alleles were not found in the uh, evidence sample, right? Um, so that means that the accused is in fact an ex exclusion. And again, here, while I'm talking about this uh, as a case of exclusion, you can also um, uh, think of um, uh, this as a, as a as an example of why it is important for us to look at the electropherograms because the result could have also been contrary uh, that uh, um, that they have in fact um, um, failed to report correctly where the person would have been an inclusion but uh, what has been reported is it reported is in fact an exclusion right. Um, so I, I, I see that I have uh, uh, very little time left. So I'll just quickly go over uh, the last portion, which is that um, we also asked, uh, this was a case where there was no statistical analysis uh, that was done. And uh, we asked the expert about uh, uh, the need for doing that. And, and they, they told us that uh, uh, they admitted while they haven't done a statistical analysis and the fact that because their laboratory doesn't do statistical analysis, which is why they haven't done it, right? Um, now, again, on statistics, the only point I'd like to make is that it is not something, because it is a requirement of the law, it is not something that um, can just be severed, um, right? Um, so this is something that the science requires, and they, therefore, it has to be something that the law requires. Um, finally, um, as we think about um, 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 the example that I've just taken, I hope that this illustrates why it is so important for us to examine the experts, um, even those experts that are covered under uh, Section 293. Uh, because because um, Section 293, I would say, is something that is going only to the mode of proof. It is not something that is creating an exception for meeting the requirements under Section 45 of the Evidence Act. And therefore, it's important that uh, we uh, not only look at the underlying documents for the reports, but we also try and uh, examine these experts and see uh, through that examination, try and uh, gather uh, information on how have they actually conducted uh, the examination and whether they've conducted that examination in the right way. Uh, so yes, so this is just a final recap of what we should look to do as, as uh, legal professionals. So firstly, uh, we should check the accuracy, reliability, um, accuracy, repeatability, and reproducibility of the forensic techniques. Uh, secondly, um, we should check if the expert is in fact qualified to perform this analysis, right? Um, next, whether the expert has provided the data and materials to support their conclusions. After that, what has been the process that the expert has followed in your case? And have they correctly followed the techniques which we know to be uh, foundationally valid? But whether those techniques have been correctly followed in your case, that still remains as a question. And we need to uh, check how that has been done. Uh, and finally, uh, whether they have accurately interpreted the results and reported them correctly. Now, to be able to do all of this, of course, it's important that you as legal professionals 
familiarize yourself with the basics uh, of different forensic disciplines. And one resource that I can point you towards is a free course that uh, we launched last year on uh, forensic science. Um, so if uh, and if you're interested, I, I, I encourage you to uh, um, uh, go to uh, Future Learn and e uh, learning platform where you'll be able to find this course. Um, so yes, so that's all from my side. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. That was an extremely insightful session. Thank you very much, Advocate Shreya, for sharing your practical experience on forensic evidence. So we have uh, two questions for you. I'll just read them out. Um, firstly, considering issues like the persisted use of the two-finger test, flaws in the chain of custody, etc., how do we bridge the gap between the law of forensic evidence and its practice by field professionals? Field professionals, I think. Field professionals. Right. Uh, thank you for that question. Yeah. So, um, certainly, I mean, it's, it's a big problem that we are still using uh, tests like the two-finger test, even though um, various high courts, even the Supreme Court has um, uh, uh, not just in Lilu v. Rajesh, but also very recently last year uh, has repeatedly said that this test should not be done. So I think the ways in which we can um, um, ensure that uh, we don't use these tests are one, that we need to do uh, adequate training of our medical professionals um, 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 who are working in our government hospitals um, and also of uh, police officers who are then in touch uh, with these medical professionals on a case-by-case -case basis. And they are the ones who raise uh, the request for examination, right? So we need to train both sides, the uh, forensic expert sides, as well as the police uh, uh, officials to ensure that they are trained to know which are the tests that should be done as part of medical examination and which are the which should not be done. I think the second thing that we need to do as legal professionals is to make sure that in every single case you challenge this, right? Because it's not enough, of course, it's, it's certainly not being enough, um, even though the um, High Court and Supreme Court has often mentioned that these tests should not be done. Even then, we, we, we often find uh, that these tests uh, creep into the medical examinations in each of our cases. So if we ensure that on a case-by-case -case basis, we are posing challenges to this and we are ensuring that uh, judges are not looking at these tests and these tests are being deemed as inadmissible, only then will we actually find that legal shift. And more importantly, what we have to strive for is a cultural shift, right? Um, so I, I, I would suggest that, yeah, this would be the way to tackle that. Okay. Um, next, we have a question. Um, do you think that the court should follow a procedure remanding cases when forensic evidence is found insufficient or um, illegal or should the procedure be that acquittals be granted um, right. uh, I think the question that they meant to ask is that um, whether us, the legal the forensic the evidence system would be able to take repeated um, remands of the same evidence right um, and of course, that's that's certainly a very uh, um, uh, difficult question to answer, and I think one that needs to also be answered on a on a case by case basis, uh, depending on also what the role that that evidence was playing as part of the evidentiary matrix. Uh, but I would say that um, even our, our our high courts have extremely wide plenary powers in three sixty seven in a confirmation case, or uh, even under three ninety one. Uh, or with 311, so um, 311 of CRPC. So I, I think that um, um, the, you can employ different strategies. Um, um, you may also want to look at, uh, um, um, uh, is it that you are asking only for the underlying documents or would you also necessarily require uh, the examination of the expert? Was the expert already examined, examined as part of the trial? And would you only ask for further cross-examination or is this a case like the case study that I was talking about where even the expert hadn't been examined? So a full, I mean, the chief as well as their cross had to be done. So I think it will depend a lot of, on a lot of these factors in terms of what strategy you're looking to employ uh, if, if you're an advocate in that case. Um, and also, I mean, just if I was to answer this question in, in terms of what should be the position, I don't think there can be one position, right? Um, 
um yeah so i don't know if that that answers it but um, yeah thank you very much advocate shreya um that's all we have for today before we end today's session i must mention the people who made this event possible first and foremost our esteemed speaker advocate shreya rastogi thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule for this lecture and sharing your valuable thoughts on this contemporary issue which i'm sure we could not find anywhere else i mean since your practical experience is something that um can benefit all of us that you're sharing it we're very thankful thank you so much i must thank honorable mr justice s mani kumar president of the indian law institute kerala and the chief justice of the high court of kerala for his unwavering support in all of our activities i also thank honorable mr justice alexander thomas executive chairperson of the indian law institute kerala he is dedicated to ensuring the success of ili's online lecture series i also thank advocate sanjay advocate sham kumar and advocate pg jayashankar for the meticulous planning and organization that culminated in today's lecture like each and every event organized by the kerala state unit of the indian law institute i must also mention my gratitude to staff of the high court who ensured that the event was streamed without any technical hitches lastly i thank each of you who have joined us virtually to make this lecture a fruitful experience thank you all with that we come to the end of today's event i wish everybody a great evening thank, thank you. you thank you for inviting me